And welcome everyone to the final debate of the G uh, panel of the GM debate powered by Hotel in Middle East. I hope two days of fascinating discussion has warmed you up all adequately for our topic, which is how hotel design is going to look in a post-COVID world. The low-touch economy and remote transformation are two phrases that we've been hearing a lot of in the hospitality design sector. And today we have two top level designers here to reflect on what major changes we're seeing in hotel design. It's Jonathan and Diane, thank you. And we have two hoteliers from exciting brands in the region to talk about how these changes are reflecting costings and customer experience. But we also want to hear from you, the audience, so please get involved with the chat function. And we'll take questions uh, from you if there's time. Uh, with the panel we've got, um, I'm anticipating a lot of debate, a lot of discussion, so we're going to dive straight in. Uh, Diane, I'd like to come to you first and ask what the design community is learning from our post-COVID experience, if we can call it post-COVID yet, and are there any positive opportunities we can take from these interesting times? Yeah, hi, Jane, and hi, everyone. I think just to start off, uh, you know, what's really significant about hotels uh, you know, if we're talking about design, they've always really been, you know, beacons in our communities because they really connect people and they connect communities and they essentially serve to immerse visitors in the culture of the place. You know, as designers, we always speak about creating experiences and, and creating a sense of place. And quite honestly, you know, we don't see this function of hotels changing at all but rather that this is an opportunity for reinvention of hotels and um, an adaption or an involvement of, of spaces and um, of offerings. Um, and actually what's quite interesting is, you know, Gensler has a research institute, which is really an extraordinary uh, group of uh, researchers. And we've actually just released the 2020 Pulse Hospitality Survey. Um, and I think, you know, what's super encouraging is that we've seen 88% of the respondents actually plan to travel. And if they can travel by December, they are 100% going to be there and traveling, which I think is really fantastic for our environment. Um, you know, they obviously, you know, th this response varies by demographic group. You know, the, obviously the younger respondents and the frequent pre-COVID travelers you know, they're really keen to get back. Um, and, you know, what are the changes that they are looking at from a reimagined future? Um, because we think, you know, that the, that how we will approach design is essentially to plan as if safety concerns, you know, are going to stay. Uh, because I think, you know, that's, that's really what we can expect. Um, and the respondents didn't expect hotels to change absolutely everything, but rather to put measures in place to ensure that spaces are really healthy, which I really love because I'm really passionate about well building. And I think if we design with that in mind, you automatically create, you know, really healthy spaces. So, you know, focus on really um, air circulation, you know, working with our MEP consultants to ensure that the air quality is really impeccable, uh, natural lighting and technology to be introduced like circadian rhythm lighting and, you know, these kinds of things and um, how we can do vitamin C infused showers, uh, you know, anything that basically contributes to health um, and just very, very simple, minimal, clean line detailing, which I know Jonathan will love as well because of his approach to design and, and design language. But, um, you know, the selection of, of touch surfaces and technology, integrated technology for touchless surfaces, you know, these kinds of things. Um, flexibility in guest rooms to include, you know, workout spaces so that guests can uh, avoid gyms and, you know, those kinds of public spaces. So actually, I really think that it gives us a lot of opportunities as designers and collaborating and partnering with operators and, and the previous panel talking about F and B, you know, curated kinds of um, opportunities. I think it actually gives us uh, an incredible uh, chance to really not focus so much on COVID, but actually really look at the power of what design can bring. 
Thank you, Diane. Jonathan, um, sounds like you've been drawn into the discussion there, so that's lined you up nicely for the, uh, the next point. Uh, your firm's working on a, a boutique hotel in Sri Lanka, so can you tell me how much of uh, these post-COVID considerations, low-touch economy, etc., have been drawn into that design? Yeah, thanks, Jane. It's, um, it, it's, it's kind of very interesting because I think regards to sort of COVID and, and even pre cursor to that being sort of quite an extensive focus towards sort of the sustainable and climate change issues that are happening most globally. This has kind of accelerated what we saw as a trend uh, from quite a while ago. I mean, as sort of Diane said, you know, we're very much obsessed about the way in which architecture also works within this sort of hospitality and, and often engaging in destination hospitality projects as well as residential. So the projects you mentioned in Sri Lanka is actually a very boutique hotel. It's only six rooms. So I think what we were seeing probably with some of our first projects, which were uh, a desert lodge in Sharjah in, in, our, in, in the UAE itself, where that again was only five rooms. So I think uh, what this sort of experience in the latter part of the, this year has actually kind of created is an acceleration into sort of this authentic sort of genuine experiences where people relate the architecture to the location in which they're in. It's been there, but I think more so people are engaging and looking at that. And then I think what's also been important, you know, the scale that we've been working at for the last few years in some of our projects has been interesting. We've worked big scale, but particularly there's been a big focus from press and also from operators asking us about well, how does it work with the small properties. So, you know, it's about the possibility that even those, you know, those small six, even up to 10 room hotels now as a v VIP luxury experience, you can take out the whole hotel with a group or with basically, you know, colleagues or however you actually have that. So that's a new offering that was not really present. And we've seen that we see even larger hotels now offering it through the summer months and even this sort of idea of the safety and security in regards to people being able to kind of take out uh, an entire hotel. And the fact of scale allows that more to be tangible. Um, with the way in which we work, um, the hotel, particularly the one that's in Sri Lanka right now, you know, it's sort of influenced by the tropical modernism. So there's a lot of indoor outdoor. In fact, actually, majority, because we're sort of fortunate with the climate, a lot of the elements are actually outdoor and fresh air. So you get not just the natural light, but you get the natural cross ventilation, which is very much sort of an indigenous culture and an indigenous way of designing within these sort of tropical locations and Sri Lanka itself. So it's more about looking uh, where we've been looking with the client about within the individual rooms, looking about the way in which we can kind of look to reduce the amount of touch elements but it's been really also about the choice of materials and also about kind of pushing forward more so in the what we believe clients and guests are looking for which is this authentic experience that continues not just from the operation and this sort of really great service but it translates into the architecture into the detailing into this authenticity which if it's in place you know it really is responding so we're just seeing a much more kind of keener interest out of the sort of post pandemic current pandemic as we're in and also this kind of slightly shift in a sort of post opulent approach where it's a back to basics it's a back to the authenticity of place and you know as Darren was saying you know within the larger hotels we've been exploring circadian light and human centric lighting for a long time but also when you can put that in its sort of basic form has been something that connects with nature and the sunrise and the sunset and the dusk and the way in which your buildings engage in those situations this makes people feel more connected with nature and i think certainly as it translates across the whole hotel design this attack you know this this is approached to looking at how nature is both drawn into hotels and how you look out and where it can be integrated with indoor outdoor space in all climates is something that's really going to be some something that's a key driver as well yeah, it's so true what you actually say regarding, you know, the guest experience, which, you know, you speak about, because I, I think it's so true that I think that is actually one of the things that we've recognized across the board, regardless of scale, is that people want to connect and they want to collaborate. It's the thing that we've missed the most. And, you know, we've really missed the connection with nature. Um, and regardless of the scale and the size of the hotel, I think the guest experience um, that what, what's really uh, required right now is essentially that connection with nature, the curated uh, 
experience, the experience of, you know, the F&B where it's an unusual um, connection and really understanding of, of what is brought. You know, we see a lot of that farm to table coming into play. Uh, the stications, previous panels spoke about value. But I think value is, is you know, how do you actually uh, value an experience? Um, and if we design something really beautifully with really simple, as you said, authentic and back to nature, back to basics, that guest experience just becomes extraordinary because the connection is so real. Laura, I wonder if I could um, bring you uh, into the discussion now. You look after Hotel Indigo, which is making its debut to the GCC with a uh, new property that's opening in downtown Dubai. You guys have got a really interesting guest experience that draws on local culture and history. So maybe you could talk us through that and talk about any changes you've had to bring to the guest experience as part of the new regulations. Uh, well, of course, the hotel has been ready to open for a while now, so pre-COVID, so uh, it's very much, uh, we had to just make amendments as, as we went. But we're quite fortunate in that um, whilst the lobby is quite small, there's nice space, etc. We had already made arrangements to have a digitalised check-in, um, so very, very low touch. Um, that actually was to meet our sustainability goals, but of course, it's, it's really fortunate that we made those arrangements. Uh, pre-COVID. Of course, we've adopted and embedded all of the um, arrangements that come through um, our IHG Clean Promise, um, which I think is a really important message. And of course, cleanliness scores are publicly available for, for everyone to see in guest review portals, etc. So we're, we've heavily embedded um, that promise into the hotel. And I think the advantage for me uh, as a hotel that was in pre-opening or is just literally about to open is that the culture of cleaning will is not something new to the team so all of the staff that have joined um of course have, this is their journey from the start so we haven't got to change the culture it's the culture right from the off so um in some cases i feel that we're incredibly fortunate that we almost don't know a life of operating the hotel before covid so everyone is of course aligned with uh, with the goals of course the organization and the brand promise etc cetera, etc cetera. and of course our own aspirations um on opening so can you tell us something as a hotel that's about to open, can you walk us through what the guest experience is going to be like for the first travellers that arrive? How is it going to be different from what might have been in hotels before? Well, of course, we've um, got the, uh, the separation that, uh, that we would have had before. And we've, of course, added in all micro, uh, micro anti-microviral uh, films uh, throughout all the high touch areas. We, of course, again, as I said, we had um, the experience with um, removing all the high touch items in the room, again, to meet our sustainability goals in terms of no menus, etc. So all the menus and all those high touch items have already been were already part of the plan to have removed. But of course, there's um, the furniture and everything is already in place and the, the spacing between everywhere. So the, the experience obviously meets all the, the COVID guidelines um, that we find in Dubai in hotels around us. She that's very reassuring for everyone who's listening in to know. Um, Justin, your hotel has been open, um, you opened pre-COVID and you're one of the um, very specialist boutique hotel. Uh, your focus is art and design. So can you tell me about something about how your guest experience has had to adapt and has it changed the aesthetics of the hotel in any way? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, obviously, the, the first concern, uh, you know, of the, the, our clientele is the, you know, feeling secure. Yeah, so uh, what we, you know, have to change is maybe that the, in regards to the, the layout, you know, we are focusing on the guest safety and security, but also we need to think about optimization in operations. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the flexible maybe layout, you know, the various layout, uh, you know, with the with the with the, the government regulations, obviously we still have the two meters between the tables. So we try to give the like you know comfort and you know safety feeling, but at the same time, as as a, you know the, the the businessman, we need to think about how we can optimize the the, the maximize the, the revenue, you know, by readjusting those layouts. Uh, you know, from the arrival experience, we we have uh, like you know, the the sanitizing 
you know, the guns, gloves, and mask. I mean, it's, it's, it's just everywhere. Yeah, I guess uh, the, the, when the time is like this, uh, people will go back to their, their, their familiar spaces. You know, they will go back to their, their hotel that they, they know, that they, you know, the, the, the restaurants that they're familiar with. I think feeling, feeling secure and safe will be, will be very important. You know, brand reputation and also the, the, the you know, the online reputation because you know, guests may need to see the, the, the physical evidences. Obviously, they cannot come, but they will go online and they'll try to find out, you know, all those uh, you know, experience from the reviews, from the trip advisors and booking your comes and hotel online. So, uh, you know, keeping up all those uh, the, the elements that what uh, our clientele is that the basic needs and wants, you know, may, you know, change or, 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 or transform during this period. Obviously, we all look at the, the post-COVID, you know, how we're going to reposition and, and then, you know, uh, and then, you know, the, the flexible reconfigurations. Yeah. So I think the, you know, what Diane mentioned about the design is, is perfectly correct that, you know, designs, the role will not diminish, but obviously, you know, as a designer or as a hotelier, we need to think about how we're going to, you know, make the, the smart, you know, the space management, you know, according to the government regulations, yeah, because that will not just, uh, you know, go away very easily. Yeah, so the variety of sitting types, what Jonathan mentioned about the like you know, outdoor spaces, whether we can go out to the street, so like an open air space, people will you know feel you know less you know the the the, the concern, that kind of thing. So there are a lot of you know, you know the, the thinking process going going around. Uh, you know, of course the the you know all those uh, safety measures there. We just are you know about to open the restaurant within a month's time, so we're just waiting for you know that period. Yes. I mean, how do you integrate all of these new safety checkpoints but still retain the boutique experience? Uh, I mean, that's, that's definitely a challenge because, you know, we are specialized, the personalized service. Yeah, I mean, you know, hospitality about the human-human touch. Uh, I guess uh, from now on, the, the intelligence that we have, yeah, about the, the guest uh, state preferences or, or, or the, the diet preferences, all those information should be integrated in the in the such system. So from the back end, we should uh, you know, utilize those information smartly from the point of booking. Yeah, then we should prepare all that, try to minimize you know all those uh, the contactless, yeah, touchless like in you know, a service point of view. Yeah, so uh, I think that the guests will appreciate that, that when they see we do acknowledge or anticipate that their the preferences and we are prepared that they would feel a lot more secure and that's what we can do at this moment, yeah? And obviously, like, you know, we can do the, like, in you know, a follow-up course, we can do other, other things, but a lot of things going online nowadays, yeah? We have, like, used the QR code, you know, they can order, like, you know, from their phones, yeah? So a lot of things are going online, so we really losing the, the, the touch point that we can make with the human, human, you know, the, the, the touch. So. Uh, until then, I think we have to use that intelligence and then you know, utilize this information from the back end and to prepare things that they feel secure and safe and they've been looked after. And then they will come back because they, they, they experience that, that we do the smart, yeah? Uh, maybe not intuitive, but like, you know, based on the data base, you know, the, the, the intelligence. Thank you. For anyone who hasn't checked out the, the Merchant House and Borrowing, it's an absolutely stunning hotel design-wise. So, um, yeah, it's great to hear how you're adapting and overcoming in this situation. I, I know an important part of checking into hotels like the Merchant House or like any hotel like Hotel Indigo is the customer experience. So do you think, uh, another question for the hoteliers in the group, do you think we're going to sacrifice some of the customer experience uh, in favor of keeping people safe? You know, so are we losing some of the interaction and the personality? Laura, do you want to pick that up? Thank you, Jane. Um, I actually don't think so. I think there's still amazing ways that we can connect with our guests, even if it's not as close as it used to be, um, be that through the, the way that we're messaging, the way that we're speaking, even as we look at our own personal lives, how we communicate has changed so much now through social media, et cetera, et cetera. So, even though we possibly won't be as close to people, we can still absolutely manage manage the message and um, yeah, have uh, have a, a clear, constant goal for 
uh, guest experience, even with these new regulations. I almost feel like it's a chance for us and a chance for all hoteliers to look at how they're going to innovate and change and be the first to do something slightly different that's not been seen before. Thank you. I'm just going to take a quick break from the, the, the discussion to talk about the results of the poll that we've been running since the start uh, of the panel. So we asked our audience, do you think factoring in design changes in response to COVID to future projects is A, an absolute must, no matter what the cost, B, something that would be implemented but reluctantly, or C, an unnecessary step? Um, the results so far is 43% of the audience think that uh, design changes are an absolute must. 44% think they would be implemented reluctantly, and 14% think they're an unnecessary step. Um, Diane, maybe what would you say to the 14% that think design changes post-COVID are a necessary step? Are an unnecessary or, or are a necessary? Unnecessary in the negative. Unnecessary. <laughs> well, I mean, I would totally disagree because I think that actually design is, is what really drives the experience. Um, and, you know, just from the surveys that we've seen, you know, with our research institute, um, people are concerned that, you know, they're going to be affected in some way from a health standpoint. So how do you actually uh, create that experience if you don't adapt some uh, changes? And I think, you know, the design changes don't necessarily need to cost an extraordinary amount. They can be really smart. Um, technology doesn't necessarily need to be applied across the board um, at a huge cost. I think it's really, you know, looking at smart ways of integrating design changes where the real difference is. So, you know, looking at, uh, for example, the guest room changes to integrate the opportunity for working. You know, there's this buzzword that the industry talks about pleasure as an, as an opportunity, for example. Um, and typically the hotel room just focused on, you know, this very small and comfortable working kind of environment. But there is really an opportunity to create these really flexible, clever, smart rooms where you can integrate places to work really comfortably or the public areas where they can become almost, you know, like co-working spaces. And, you know, there's been a lot of media around um, the office as the uh, hotel or the hotel as the office, which I think those with very small, smart, clever innovative design solutions can totally transform and regenerate and uh, reinvent a, a space um, and create an opportunity for another stream of revenue. So I would agree, disagree completely because I think design has extraordinary power. Thank you. And, and Jonathan, what would you say to the 43% that say design changes are an absolute must no matter what the cost? I mean, if, we, if we're looking at if cost's not an option, what elements can we bring into the hotel experience design-wise? I think hotels are actually have the opportunity to sort of like be the forefront and the pioneers of the way in which we respond to, um, to this kind of, you know, this global pandemic situation. I mean, let us not forget that this is essentially a massive cultural shift across the whole globe so your habits will change it's uh you know what you're now going through now you start to accept more things you might not have done you start to kind of think from sense of security and safety and those sort of things so i think people's minds will obviously adapt to what it is and it will become embedded to an extent and your expectations of what you want to feel secure or your greetings in the way in which you enter spaces and the, the distancing is something that people be more aware of so it's about knowing your guest and knowing what they're looking for as Justin was saying and also Diane and old Laura but I, I think you know there is this opportunity that it shouldn't be so visual it shouldn't be so almost clinical it really can't because hotel experience is all about drawing guest experience that's why there's so many different brands so many different types of hotels so many different experiences like Diane was saying you can work in a hotel you can sleep in a hotel you can basically live in a hotel there are all these so many different layers that's available to it um, so it's important to basically you know understand all those elements but it's about human distribution in space it's not about separation because as humans, we're inherently social. We want to be able to interact. But 
in a way in which Diane was saying is that you know design is a very important thing and actually the the information of big data coming from the likes of Laura and Justin the, the front line in regards to kind of cust you know customer experience feeding that through into all of the sort of the architecture and the interior design about how we work within the design aspects and use that as a tool to innovate and to basically challenge and to create you know clever spaces that still retain that level of intimacy through you know lighting levels through clever positioning in regards to rather than you know a geometric school layout of two meters between each thing so i think the opportunity is to really pioneer through the guest experience and hotels about how we do deal with this understanding that there has been a major shift in regards to what people perceive but still as what Justin was saying you really want to have that guest experience and I think the key is also to have uh, a real higher awareness of who your individual guests are and that allows you then to be able to tailor uh, from the rooms to the actual guest experience of the check-in of what the preferences are and that's essentially what generation sort of x and y are looking for anyway um, so we're already kind of taking this thing I feel that what's happened within COVID it's just been an acceleration about what people have been having at the back of their mind that's now being put towards the forefront and now is the great opportunity like Diane was saying is to actually take this on board through design through even the current projects so that are on the drawing boards to the ones that are actually in that process really look at those again and say well we don't want to just have this you know this very kind of regimented almost you know medical secure really against the whole experience you really have to work closely to kind of make that experience something integrated to a point where it vanishes and I think that's where hotels really have an opportunity to do this uh, as a sort of an industry and sector what I'm hearing is a lot of potential change, um, and with potential change, there's inevitably comes cost, um, which brings us to the second half of the discussion, discussion on how elements that previously might have been valued, engineered out of hotel design, final plans might now have to be included. How are those decisions going to be taken, and how will the final cost be passed on to the guests? I think there's one for the hoteliers. So, Justin, would you like to start by commenting on that point, whether the, the value engineering is no longer an option, especially for boutique hotels like yourself? I, will, I mean, for us, you know, we have many, you know, many, many like small, small, delicate elements as a boutique hotel, and that includes lots of, you know, the, the paper or handmade fabrics Lots of collaterals, you know, lots, lots of like you know the the, the uh, whimsical things in the room, uh, and uh, you know they cannot be like you know value engineered at all. Yeah, uh, you know, I guess this is really case by case, and the, 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 you know depends on your clientele. But for us, like we really need to give like you know really best shot, you know, whenever the guest comes. But obviously, if we need to do to do this, I guess that the, you know based on that your clientele number one, and of course the, the feeling security we're talking about, but as Jonathan mentioned that, you know, this is already happening, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's just a matter of time, I guess, yeah. But I guess, uh, you know, as Diane mentioned, the design, the, the world comes in, the how smart, how flexible, you know, they can be reconfigurated, you know, when everything's like, you know, passed, you know, out, then, then we can think about that, obviously, uh, the decision should be based on the, your clientele, their, their preferences, and their, their demands. Yeah, obviously we try to be, you know, emotionally connected. Yeah, I mean a lot of this going individual, and you know, I think the social distance distancing things already happen because a lot of people is just on the phone or iPad. They want to have their own space. Yeah, so I think these things are already happening. But I think this, this is really sensitive matter whether whether you know we're gonna reflect our costing based on these kind of things because we really need to look at the long-term relationship. The customer equity can be diminished very easily. So if you look at the short-term instant, like you know, profitability, uh, I think that this is time that we need to spend a bit more and, and do, do investment like with the capital expenditures, if there are any equipment that we need to buy. But obviously we need to think smart that, that how we're going to enhance guest experience and for them to come back, yeah, for them to come back. So, you know, emotionally connected, whatever the, whatever the, it is required for them to feel secure and safe and connected with us, I think that should be the decision-making process. I think we experience changes in how 
people interact with hotels and how what people want from their guest experience um, in terms of where previously they might have been using the hotel as a base to go out and explore the city. It sounds like now that they could be spending more time in the room or more time in the hotel itself. Uh, Laura, perhaps you could talk about how Hotel Indigo is it, it's about to open. You, I know you brought in a lot of design elements from the surrounding city. So are you looking to keep trying to retain guests within the hotel or you're still trying to signpost them out towards exploring Dubai? That's a really interesting question, actually. And I think where we're really fortunate is that we do have so much design, so many design elements in the hotel. There is so much to look at and so much to enjoy within the hotel. Whilst we encourage people, of course, to go out and explore our neighbourhood, and that's you know the whole ethos of the brand, we really have brought the neighbourhood inside. So in the bedrooms, there really is so much to look at, so much to see, that there is plenty of you know opportunity to spend time in the room. And of course, the hotel as well. So we're very fortunate that it's a hotel come art gallery. So on every floor, it's represented by a different artist that we found, either Emirati artists or um, expatriate artists with strong links to Dubai that we have represented through the floors. So you could spend hours in the hotel and there's still so much to see and look at and inquire about. And it, it's really nice that, that we have that opportunity. Sounds great. We've actually got a question from um, from Ksenia in our audience. She wants to ask you, Laura, uh, that you draw on, as the hotel brand draws on inspiration from the neighborhood, how, how has that impacted the design of the hotel? I know I've seen some images from inside the hotel, but maybe you could tell people who haven't what it looks like inside Hotel Indigo. Uh, so the hotel um, is designed around our neighbourhood story and our neighbourhood story is the story of the evolution of the Dubai Creek. So at every single touch point uh, we show how the, the creek has evolved or uh, into this new market um, in Business Bay and how the city has changed from an old trading town where you would be... Um, they, people were trading in the souks, et cetera, et cetera, into this um, great city that we we have today through. So people would trade in the souks and the evolution of how we're now trading in the malls, for example. We can't, we'll look forward to seeing it. I understand you. Is it opening later this month or is it next, next month, October? Next month, yeah. It's opening in October. So, yeah, we'd love to show you around. We can tell you all about the neighbourhood story and just show you all the touch points where uh, it's reflected right from the arrival into the lobby, into all of the public spaces. Uh, um, our bar is actually inspired by the Satwa neighbourhood of Dubai. So we've bought Satwa over as well. So, um, so it's a really interesting story with uh, with lots of things to look at. That sounds amazing. Um, we're moving towards the end of our discussion now, um, but I think there's, we've still got a lot to explore. I uh, wonder if the, the two designers on the panel could maybe share your views about value engineering and talk about, you know, are you seeing, do you have plans in the pipeline? Are you seeing elements being now being considered that previously would have been en value engineered out? I'm thinking about antimicrobial materials, more space within F&B spaces, that kind of thing. I so think... About to speak, so let's Jonathan, you go first, please. No, no, it, it, it's funny what basically you know Laura and Justin were saying. So it does feel as though maybe the last few years a lot have been focused a lot of the kind of public spaces in the hotel, and maybe the, the rooms have been sort of kept you know towards the, the sort of small scale. But now, obviously, as Diane was saying, and also what they're saying about the rooms and would and probably become the more focused because their needs are going to change. You know, in-room dining become far more experienced. The idea of actually possibly having outdoor space in those areas um, working. You know, you might get a guest that actually now comes and spends longer term, almost like the lines with the sort of service department side, but they're coming and staying for a longer period. So I, I think the value engineering is also about where is the money spent? You know, looking at actually which aspects would actually be directly responsive to what the clients are wanting and all how you're creating an experience for the clients, whether you spend more money towards the bedrooms and towards the guest experiences, key spaces on each floor and reducing down some of your, you know, multiple F&B where you just essentially only have one F&B versus five or six. I think it's about money distribution could be very interesting on the larger scale hotels. What we're seeing at an architect, because we obviously do a lot of boutique destination hotels where they take you to new locations or they give you a new experience. What we've got now within our Sri Lanka portfolio projects, we've got the hotel, which will be opening probably Q1 next year, which is a six bedroom boutique. But we also have a sort of a, 
a private villa estate that was designed in a way in which it was also uh, able to facilitate, you know, vacation home. But what we've also seen, you know, the idea is that we've actually got a service building that supports, you know, staff accommodation, laundry, kitchen, all of the things adjacent to the to the house. So maybe what might happen is a way in which hoteliers start to look at their distribution of portfolio so they can cover a more diverse, interesting kind of portfolio of properties. As particularly as actually now the guests are wanting more individual experiences and as Laura was saying you know essentially binding it to the local neighborhood or binding it to the local culture you know but best you know the opportunity that might also tie in with the actual scale and size of the architecture it wouldn't make sense for any of the projects that we did on the south coast into Sri Lanka to be you know a 200 uh, key hotel like maybe we're looking at in Nairobi but it really was about this genuine contextual experience but still focusing on that guest experience and actually integrating all these different elements so I think just to summarize I think it's interesting about where is the money allocated in the project rather than essentially this value engineering across whitewash and then I think maybe from a business point of view I mean it's a tough one because small properties can't always make the money but I'm sure that's where the hoteliers will innovate is actually looking at a diversity of portfolio that really fall in line with these kind of very unique one-off or individual spaces or places according to their portfolio in different parts of the world. Thank you. I'm sure it's uh, heartening to the two hoteliers on the panel who have both have very unique hotels to hear that that's the kind of experience that's going to be driven forward. Um, we, we're getting more audience questions and everyone's um, Everyone's in that uh, in that Thursday mode and ready to chat. Uh, Diane, we have a question uh, from the audience for you. Uh, Jitendra would like to know: as as an architect, what is the single most important factor in the design of a hotel room? And I guess you could answer that pre-COVID and post-COVID. How has that changed? Well, I think you know what's what's really interesting, and I, I think we all aligned in the way that we've responded. Um, to these questions across the board. I think, you know, hoteliers are, are naturally wonderful at attention to detail and service um, and care. So, you know, regarding whether we're designing a boutique hotel, whether we're designing a large scale hotel, I think the care that's uh, taken in providing an experience um, and opportunity to really engage with, with the place, you know, we've spoken about immersing um, ourselves in the culture and the stories of the place. I don't think any of, of that changes. Um, when it comes to, you know, the design, the architectural design language, I think what's going to be interesting going forward is there was such a drive to reduce the footprints and the size of uh, rooms. But with the changes that we've seen, I think architecturally that footprint um, is potentially going to shift and we see that in the briefs that we are receiving now is you know look at flexibility uh look at movable furniture not as much you know fixed in um look at the scale and the size and how that integrates uh with nature which you know jonathan had had spoken a lot about um and i think that's going to drive design to a large extent um and i think you know that you know, we had spoken about the kinds of habits and, and the way that we are working and the way that we actually, uh, the way that our lives have become so blended. You know, we talk about Blur's Day being, you know, that everything like your work and your life has just completely become a blur. And I think this is going to um, shift how we actually design and, and how we approach spaces, both architecture and interiors. Um, you know, we always talk about actually design from the inside out. Um, and that actually drives what we were speaking about with regards to uh, value engineering, rather that the approach at the outset when you're actually doing the planning becomes value management, which is what jo uh, Jonathan was speaking about, which essentially is decide where your key experiences are and just focus on those because you'd never get a second chance to make that first impression as a hotelier. So when you come in and you have that wonderful first impression, it sets the tone. Um, and I think that's, that's really key. And, and that's what design essentially is. It's focusing attention where it makes the difference and putting the importance on the elements that are actually going to add to the experience. So I, I think um, hopefully that's answered the question because it's such a broad question. 
that uh, it, it has a variety of answers. We love broad questions because they invite lots of, uh, lots of discussion. So do you think we could see, Diane, is the rooms getting bigger but other areas getting smaller? You know, like, oh, I'm thinking all day diners, gyms, that kind of thing, as more moves into the room and uh, less takes place in communal areas of the hotels? Look, I think the public spaces are, you know, we're seeing the move that the public spaces become these blended spaces, spaces where you can work and where you can collaborate eventually um, and where we can actually, uh, you know, connect the community because that's really the function of a hotel in a neighborhood. It connects with the, with the city, it connects with the neighborhood and it's, it connects people. Um, and I think that's, that's really key. So I think the spaces like the, um, exhibition spaces, the business spaces, etc. we see the shift becoming more flexible. So flexible spaces, spaces that can be repurposed and reused in a number of different ways, very innovatively. Um, and I think that's what's really exciting as designers is we see the opportunity of creating spaces that can actually move and shift and, you know, what innovations can we bring in there. Uh, the guest rooms, you know, obviously that's what hoteliers sell. You know, they sell the guest room. And uh, with people traveling and, you know, as we've all mentioned and we know that people will travel for business and then they will extend their stay to explore the city. Staycations are becoming really popular and um, people will want to do exercise in their room. They will want to, you know, as, as Jonathan had mentioned, uh, they will want to take meals in their rooms, etc. So I think, again, you know, that flexibility and size um, and opportunity to maybe have that when you walk in, you don't actually, you know, see a see a bed as as a first off call, um, and to be able to design a room that actually can be completely flexible and can be moved and transformed. So transformative design, I think, is a wonderful opportunity for the future. Thank you. I think we've got two good examples of hotels here. You mentioned connection with the community, both Hotel Indigo and the Merchant House both have great connection with the communities they're located in. Um, they're certainly raising a lot of questions from uh, the audience. Olga would like to know, are any famous artists uh, uh, exhibited at Hotel Indigo? I think it's local artists you have, Laura, isn't it? Yes, yes, we do have local artists, but we have a very, very unique installation, which is pride of place in our lobby. I'm still in secrecy at the minute and we will reveal that the name of that artist and details of the installation um, once we open. But uh, it's very, very exciting and it is this artist's first installation in the Middle East. So we're, we're very excited and proud to uh, have something special for our guests on arrival. Yeah, we'll look forward to hearing everyone at the um, we we'll wrapping up now, but it would be really remiss of us if I didn't let Justin um, have a final word about famous artists, because I understand there's some um, new artworks coming into the Merchant House. Justin, are you able to tell us anything about that? Okay, so at the Merchant House, we have uh, you know serious art collections. We have more than 300 art pieces, and they're all original. So 70% is the Bahraini, the up-and-coming artist, and also established. And a 30% is the internationally well known and obviously the very famous ones, namely like you know the, we have a, recently just added the, the Picasso's piece, and also we have Damian Hurst, Chagall, and Matisse, Gauguin. I mean Shasha Jaffrey. Uh, we have like a tons of uh, you know the, the the famous art collections, but just around the corner of your corridor inside your room. So, I mean, you know, people can may ask, uh, can I stay with uh, Marilyn Monroe from, you know, Andy Warhol? Yeah, that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, obviously the question is, are they, you know, the printed or the real, but we, you know, luckily our art pieces are real art pieces. And, you know, and also we have a nice mixture of the local artists. Yeah, so the main, you know, the, the you know, spaces we are, we are featuring the, Bahraini artists like you know the the you know the the Asha Al Moed, Jamal Abdul Rahim, Omar Al Rashid. I mean, we have uh, tons of us. Please come and visit us in Bahrain. Uh, we are you know right at the Thank center of Bahrain. Yes. 
Yeah, that's um, a food call all the way from our design, our design round to uh, architecture and art again. And yeah, if you check out everyone, the next issue of Commercial Interior Design October this year, we're going to be doing a bit of a feature on the Merchant House and some of the new artwork they've got there. So uh, please do look out for that. Uh, thank you everyone today for taking part. It's been a fascinating two days of discussion. I think we've ended with a very interesting panel on a high note. Um, I'd like to wish you all happy Blur's Day. Diane's introduced me to that new term. Uh, everyone have a great weekend and thank you to all our panelists and everyone who took part in the discussion. And looks like that's gonna go on for some time. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, goodbye. <laughs>